This is a very subdued version of Want to Know Why? Ask How. Howard Demungus. Lou Reed died two days ago. From the articles that have come out, a lot of which have been extremely good ones, it's obvious that Lou was extremely important in a lot of people's lives. He was certainly important in mine. He was important in mine because the two of us met, the two of us spent time together, the two of us discovered that we had a series of intersections that was utterly beyond belief, the two of us lost touch with each other but not really. I left the music business how many years after meeting Lou? I probably met Lou in 1974. I left the music industry 14 years later. I was in bed for 15 years with a ghastly illness, chronic fatigue syndrome. When I came out, one of the first things that I did was appear as a gallery exhibit doing an hour and a half performance at Jack the Pelican Gallery in Williamsburg. It was my first opportunity to meet people outside of my own home in 15 years. Of all the people I had known in the music industry, only one star came, and that was Lou Reed. Lou walked out halfway through the performance. I said some outrageous things on stage. I said that Mother Nature loves those who oppose her the most. I said that Mother Nature is not the kind and wonderful sort that we've been told over and over again. I said that the planet is not mothering, kind, and nice. Far from it. These are things that offended Lou's political sensibilities. But he came. He came. And there was always the opportunity to sit down with him someday and discuss the things we disagreed with. That opportunity is gone. There have been some extremely good appreciations of Lou written in places like the New York Times over the course of the last few days. But they're missing something. They're missing something extremely important. Those of us who are creative are not just walkers on the wild side. We are not just those who step outside the boundaries and sum things up from a distance. We are those who sum things up. We are summaries of the context of our times. And missing from all of the articles that I've seen on Lou is the context. The context that made Lou who he was. The context that knit the two of us together. I want to read you a few lines. I want to give you a personal sense of the context that made them. You know these lines. They are from Walk on the Wild Side. One is Holly came from Miami, Florida, FLA, hitchhiked her way across the USA, plucked her eyebrows on the way, shaved her legs, and then he was a she. She says, hey, babe, take a walk on the wild side. Candy came from out on the island. In the back room, she was everybody's darling, but she never lost her head, even when she was giving head. Hey, babe, take a walk on the wild side. Little Joel never once gave it away. Everybody had to pay and pay. A hustle here and a hustle there. Hey, that's just the way it goes in New York on the wild side. A sugar plum fairy came and hit the streets looking for soul food and a place to eat she was on the wild side too Jackie is just speeding away thought she was James Dean for a day then I guess she had a crash Valium would have helped that bash where does all this stuff come from why when Lou and I sat down in roughly 1974 did we discover we had so many things in common let me get personal my own stuff here I grew up in Buffalo New York very different from where Lou grew up Lou was born in Brooklyn New York Lou grew up in Freeport uh, Long Island Um, Buffalo is a very different much more dismal much more primitive place 
I came to New York City with my best friend and got to spend time here without any parents for the first time when I was 16 years old. And one of the things that astonished me the most was when we were walking down God knows where, uh, the walking in the West Village, a place that to us was legendary because it was the home of the Beatniks. It was legendary to Lou Reed, too, because the Beatniks were strong when he was a kid and a strong influence on him. These were people obsessed with poetry, obsessed with drugs, obsessed with Zen Buddhist Satori, obsessed with being bohemians, obsessed with being on the very outside of things, obsessed with being nonconformists in an era that was famous for its conformity. My best friend and I were walking down the street and behind us were two of the most gorgeous women you've ever seen in your life. Absolute knockouts. The problem was they weren't women. They were men. They were transvestites. And they did the gorgeousness of womanhood in ways that were utterly beyond belief. I had never seen anything like it in my life. There was nothing transgender in New York City, at all. I mean in Buffalo, New York, at all. But that's what was happening. How old would I have been? 16 years old, 1959. In 1959, when Lou Reed was in his last years of high school, and so was I. Then I went out to the West Coast, dropped out of school, and began hitchhiking and riding the rails, that is, illegally riding freight trains up and down the West Coast. Why? I was seeking the kind of adventure that I'd read about in Jack Kerouac and on the road in the same books that Lou Reed was reading. Um, there's this line about Sugar Plum Fairy came and hit the streets looking for soul food and a place to eat. What in the world was Lou talking about? Well, in my case, I was hitchhiking with a sleeping bag, sleeping by the side of the road out in the farmlands, um, no place to stay, no place where I knew I could stay, just expecting to be able to crash by accident at somebody's home, um, standing at hot dog stands um, with an outdoor stand, a place where you stand, and there's an aisle where you eat, and the aisle has ketchup and mustard and relish. I couldn't afford the hot dogs. I couldn't afford the other food at the place. But I could pick up a, a handkerchief, um, put a bunch of relish on it, put a bunch of mustard and ketchup on it, and uh, and eat it. Eat the napkin. That's the kind of thing that those of us who were seeking adventure were doing in those days to find it. Um, that's where Sugar Plum Fairy um, hitting the streets came from. When I came, eventually, I came back to New York City and went back to school. One day I was walking down Bleecker Street, which is a street famous in uh, Beatnik and, um, uh, and nonconformist, bohemian lore, um, a place where uh, Bob Dylan would get his or had gotten his start um, and somebody beckoned me from across the street I came over to see who it was it was somebody who recognized me from one of my classes at NYU um, he said look I'm working as a barker here at this club we have a dressing room if you ever need a place where you can sit down and do things or just hang out uh, why don't you come here and sit down backstage what I didn't realize is that this was a club um, for transvestites. It was a club uh, for transvestite performers. And I took him up on his offer. I used to go out on dates on Saturday night. The girl I was dating would go back to her home in New Jersey. I'd take her to the bus after we'd seen a movie. And I would come to the club and sit down backstage in the dressing room. And what would happen in that dressing room? Men who had just been performing as Bessie Smith. Men who had just been performing as Marilyn Monroe. Men who had just been performing as as a new star, Diana Ross, would come slithering off stage in their exquisitely tight dresses, would unzip them, would take off their padded bras, would take off their padded hips, would slither into um, full-length leather, um, one-zip, um, uh, skin-tight suits, and change into males. But they would be as females in their female garb they would be masculine and masterful as all hell as females they would be swish they would be limp-wristed and feminine as could possibly be and they would slither out into the night they were extremely nice to me i was sitting there with a yellow pad 
writing, Dear Mom and Dad, here in New York City, another perfectly normal week, nothing interesting is happening. If my mother, mom, and dad had known what was going on around me, they would have bust a gasket. That's where um, people like Holly Woodlawn came from. Holly Woodlawn was Holly, who came from FLA, hitchhiked her way across the USA, plucked her eyebrows on the way, shaved her legs, and then she was a he. Meanwhile, I had a uh, poetry classes from the poet in residence at NYU, and in those poetry classes there was a girl who sat at the diametrically opposite side of the class from me. I was trying to write what I considered to be poetry. She was writing multiple choice poetry with pictures. Multiple choice poetry with pictures? That wasn't poetry. It violated every sense of poetic propriety that I possibly had. And remember, I am deeply improprietous. Um, I like breaking the bounds in every conceivable way and what she was doing just horrified me one day we were walking out of class together we were squeezing through the door I was trying to stay as far away from her as possible but we were squeezed together by accident and suddenly she slipped a piece of paper into my hands I opened it up and read it when I got into the corridor and it said something about somebody with lizard lips it was a love poem it was to me So, believe it or not, I actually started talking to her. That was enough to soften me up. She was a part of a new crew, a new group of people doing new and strange things. A crew that included people like Holly Woodlawn. A crew that included all of the transvestites, many of the transvestites, some of them at least, in New York City. It was run by an artist. That artist's name was Andy Warhol. Um, that's where all of these elements oh I forgot to mention while I was out on the west coast we had discovered these new things called drugs Um, while I was hitchhiking while I was riding the freight trains we had discovered LSD we had discovered methadrine um, we had discovered peyote um, and we had discovered uh, one of the people that I used to travel with um, a wonderful terrific girl um, would take peyote or would take LSD and she'd writhe on the floor for eight hours straight in cycles of birth and reincarnation the uh, birth death and reincarnation the death took her into hells that were absolutely beyond belief and coming out of them was extremely difficult the moments of reincarnation would last just seconds and then she'd be back into the hells again that is where Jackie is just speeding in a way thought she was James Dean for a day um, then I guess she had a crash Valium would have helped that bash that's where all of that came from meanwhile I married somebody at the, I was 21 years Years old. <laughs> I certainly wasn't prepared for marriage, but I married somebody. And the somebody I married had had a previous husband, by which she'd had a five-year-old child. And her previous husband, she had come from Kingston, New York. Her father, the woman I married, had helped found the conservative party, of all things, in Kingston, New York, which sounded absolutely loathsome and wretched to me, but she didn't seem to be that sort. She had married a poet from the nearby town of Woodstock. Um, And the poet's sister had married, in turn, a poet named Delmore Schwartz. Well, when I was 16 years old, the girl next door to me in Buffalo, New York, with whom I was madly in love, had fallen in love with the poetry of Delmore Schwartz, and in particular had fallen in love with a poem called The Heavy Bear That Walks With Me. That seems to be about how your body is not the body you choose, and every day it's with you, and it doesn't obey the rules that you would like. Your face is nowhere near as gorgeous as you'd want it to be. Your tummy is nowhere near as taut and muscular as you'd want it to be. Somehow that heavy bear of a body goes with you everywhere you do wears you down, burdens you, captures you, and yet it's you. And yet it gives you every freedom that you've ever had. Um, When I discovered that my new wife's former husband's sister had been married to Delmore Schwartz, I got extremely interested in Schwartz's work, and I read everything that Delmore Schwartz had ever written. Well, eventually, through means that we won't go into, as part of the adventure, that it started with Jack Kerouac, that it started with doing drugs on the West Coast, that it started with accidentally helping to start the sexual revolution out on the West Coast, eventually, I tripped into something I knew absolutely nothing about, something that other kids had never allowed me into, because I, after all, was a science geek 
geek. Um, science geeks are not allowed in polite society where kids have parties and listen to things like rock and roll. I tripped into popular culture, something I'd never been allowed near, and became the editor of a music magazine. And one of the people that I decided to feature in that music magazine was Lou Reed. And Lou Reed, I was told, would be a monster of an interview. Lou Reed went out of his way, I was told, to deliberately humiliate every interviewer who tripped across his path. But I went to interview Lou Reed anyway. And what did I discover? Lou Reed and I were so similar, it was ridiculous. We loved the same poet, Delmore Schwartz. Lou Reed had gone to Syracuse University, where Delmore Schwartz had been the poet in residence, and Lou Reed had fallen in love with Delmore Schwartz and fallen in love with Delmore Schwartz's work. I was probably the only other human Lou had ever met in his life who had read every word that Delmore Schwartz had ever written. Lou Reed's uh, roommate at Syracuse University had been a kid named Lincoln Suedos. I had grown up with Lincoln Suedos in Buffalo, New York. Lincoln Suedos and I were two 99-pound weaklings with giant Jewish noses, two kids that everybody loved to hate. We didn't run into each other very often in Buffalo, but every once in a while there we were doppelgangers, staring at the weirdness of other human who was as ugly <laughs> and socially unacceptable as we were. Uh, Lincoln Suedos had been Lou Reed's roommate. Um, Lou was extremely fond of Lincoln. Lincoln was trying, had been trying to make it as a writer in New York City. Then Lincoln had gone into radical depression. One day I ran into Lincoln at the airport in Buffalo, New York, on my way back home from visiting my parents to New York City. Lincoln had changed dramatically. He was on crutches. Why? He had become so depressed he'd thrown himself in front of a subway car and lost an arm and a leg. And the two of us sat back, sat together on the plane all the way back to New York City. City, comparing notes on our various forms of depression. Obviously, Lincoln's was a lot more visible than mine, with a missing arm and a leg. Eventually, Lincoln had been found in an abandoned store. He had gone so far downhill that he had died of starvation in that abandoned store. But Lincoln had been a dear, close friend. I became close and dear with him when he was in New York City. He had been a close friend of mine. He had been a close friend of Lou's. Eventually, by the way, Lincoln Suedo's younger sister would become, would develop a big career on Broadway and would write a book about Lincoln. Um, Lou and I discovered we had all these threads in common, including the beatnik movement, including poetry, um, including the importance of poetry, adventure, and the arts in our lives. And it bound us together. So Lou did come to see me perform in 2003 on October 4th at Jack the Pelican Gallery in Williamsburg, an extremely important event for me because it represented the end of 15 years of a nightmare of solitary confinement. And Lou did walk out because I said that Mother Nature was not kindly and nice and this planet is not a warm and cherishing place and it's our obligation to change this planet in ways that make her warm and nurturing and nice. And I did look forward to the day when Lou and I would sit down and have that discussion. I thoroughly anticipated that Lou would walk out on me right in the middle, even of that conversation. But Lou was precious to me. There were so many threads that held us together. So when you think of Take a Walk on the Wild Side, remember the background of the 1950s, the Bohemian movement that made us both adventurers, Jack Kerouac on the road that made us both adventurers, poetry, one of the primary kayaks of human adventure, the transvestite background of the day when men dressing as women was something radically and profoundly new, even newer than the sexual revolution, even newer than the drag revolution. That was the era that Lou summed up in ways that were brilliantly his and his alone. This is Howard the Humongous speaking for, to you from the future. That it's your job and my job to make especially now that Lou Reed is not around to help us make it. It's up to you and me. Now to see if I can find the off button.